So let me just start with a disclaimer that uh, I am not in any way remotely pretending that I'm so much smarter and have better answers than anybody in the room. So this, this entire presentation, in fact, is really sharing with you just how we're thinking about taking this challenge on. It's not, this is not a, a declaration of victory, but a, a kind of a, a sharing of a work in progress. And what's actually most interesting about this for me is that um, what I'm sharing now is different from what I talked about six months ago, and I assume, I hope, is not as far as I'm going to be able to talk about this six months from now. So, okay. Um, and it started with us kind of having a sense of um, how do we move, well, let me actually put it this way. The term we started to use to describe our approach to innovation um, without falling into a trap of somehow seeming as if we were being overly critical of the field um, is to say that our, our approach to the entire early childhood field is one of loving, supportive, nurturing, constructive dissatisfaction with what, how much we're accomplishing. Uh, and to say that, that if the goal is to um, really um, improve life outcomes for all children across a variety of, of circumstances, that um, we've got a long way to go. And that's, that's not, and, and you know, I'm a pediatrician by training, so I, you know, I don't play that card too much, the pediatric card, because it's actually, it gets more criticism in the early childhood and human services as well. People talk about the medical model and making everything at the pathology and stuff like that, which is obviously not what this field is all about. Um, but there is, um, there's, a, there's a useful analogy that I'm gonna talk about in my presentation um, to use in the medical world is that there are diseases um, that we have made incredible progress in treating um, uh, to the point where it's just a whole different world. And there are other situations and conditions where the progress has been slow. I think cancer would be one good example where there are some types of cancers where uh, the effectiveness of treatments uh, over the years has been staggering in terms of improvements. And there are some cancers that we kind of barely can um, improve the survival rate for now compared to 10, 20, 30 years ago. But nobody is saying good enough. And nobody is saying, you know, people in need is saying, well, what's the point in putting money into cancer research if we have some cancers that still are not uh, curable? And nobody is saying for cancers where we've improved the survival rate somewhat, but still a lot of people have died. Well, we've made progress, it's good enough. Why do we have to keep doing research? And it just became really clear that there's no reason we should treat the early childhood world and its focus on reducing disparities and learning outcomes and health outcomes by saying, well, if you know, we've got some reasonable progress, good enough, well, you know, why, why should we be critical? So that's the spirit from which I'm coming is this is a field that has tremendous richness, tremendous strength, um, a very strong and growing knowledge base and is taking on very big challenges. And I think we have to find the right balance between justifiably being very um, proud of the accomplishments of the field and the knowledge base of the field and constructively dissatisfied with how we're doing in some areas and see that as a sign of strength, not as a sign of defensiveness or weakness, but see that as a sign of strength. And that's um, a lot of what I'm going to share with you now comes from what I've learned um, in the last half a dozen years from interacting more with people I never worked with before. So if I'm, I'm not big on looking back and wishing I could redo my life, but my advice to any of you who are early in your career who care about the stuff we're talking about is um, you ignore the knowledge of the business world at your peril. Uh, that, there's a, that there's a knowledge base and, a, and a, a, a dimension of the business world which is tended to be seen as the enemy. People are just saying, well, you know, where are the results and why are you spending so much money? Um, a lot of what I'm going to share with you is how we've adapted things that we've learned from very smart and talented people in the for-profit world who are relentless about getting to where they want to be and have a sense of kind of how to um, use metrics to determine that. So um, this is the challenge, building a platform. There's no R&D dimension in this field. Every healthy field has an R&D dimension. Um, business that, businesses that are at the top of their game and dominate their field devote some portion of their resources every year to research and development to make sure that wherever the field is going next, they're going to get there first. Because you can't stay on top of a field just by being the best, okay? Um, and that's true in biomedical research. It's true um, 
in many dimensions of other fields that have tended to not have anything to do with early childhood. And we started out thinking about how could we, where's the R&D dimension in the early childhood field, and discovered that there is no R&D dimension in the early childhood field. Certainly not the way R&D works in the for-profit world. It's not to say that I am into making financial profit out of this, but that, because um, this is not a finance, this is not a bottom line, how much money we're going to make, but, but there are lessons to be learned. So um, here are the challenges, and we are all challenge facing these challenges together. And without taking away from any of the, um, the tremendous progress that's been made, here are some harsh realities. Preventable disparities in learning and school achievement and social mobility and lifelong health are large, and in some cases they're growing not in Western Australia for some of the stuff that I've seen, but clearly we have not completely reduced these barriers. And so this is not a mission accomplished. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Second, best practices in early childhood clearly make a difference. We have demonstrated over and over and over again about how we can move the needle. Um, but the differences um, in most cases are not big enough, at least not for my taste. Um, and that they have increased substantially in half a century. I'll show you those data in a second. Um, and third, there are creative people all over the place who have interesting ideas and are doing things, um, some of which have real promise. Um, but there's no clear pathway to impact at scale. And there are very few opportunities for people who are innovating to find out from each other what they're doing. Professional meetings, the thing I love, one of the things I love most about the early childhood field and that drives me crazy about the early childhood field, is how we spend most of our time telling each other how much we love what we're doing. And then we go to meetings and we tell each other, oh, I love your program, it's so wonderful. And we have, we have poster sessions and presentations and everybody says, this is so great. Justifiably, it's a lot of great stuff. But we don't, you know, we're not like economists who have meetings and trash each other all the time and criticize each other all the time and point out all the things that are wrong. And the journals, we have journals that publish results but don't publish studies that didn't find anything. And we have professional meetings where people show what they're accomplishing and don't talk about what they're struggling with. So these are problems and we should, the field is strong enough and healthy enough right now to take them on. We will be stronger if we build, build this into our culture. So um, I apologize for the fact that these data are from uh, U.S. studies only. I'm sorry about that. Um, and take them for what they're worth. They're reasonably generalizable, but not completely. We, um, in a group, I had a national forum that spent four years coding data from every study that had been published in 47 years, from birth to the to school entry, to ask what have we learned from half a century of the best studies that we have of early childhood intervention programs. These were all either randomized controlled trials or high quality quasi-experimental studies. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. So let me kind of walk you through the slide for a second. Here's, so you see the horizontal line that says zero. It means that no effect, okay? So the first thing you see, these are representative of the best studies in the field over a half a century. So the first thing that's noticed was that we have study, study after study after study have shown you can make a difference, have shown statistically significant positive impact. So the question of can we really improve outcomes? That's been asked and answered a gazillion times already. We don't have to do that anymore. The answer is yes, we can do that. The size of these bubbles is a relative reflection of the sample size. So the larger bubbles were studies of larger kids. So here's, here's the message. You see the Perry Preschool Project and the Abbasidarian Projects, which are the big long-term follow-up studies in the U.S. Each had standard deviations. Well, Perry had a standard deviation difference, an effect size of greater than one standard deviation. These were big studies in terms of outcome, small studies that were just like 50 some odd kids in the treatment group, 50 some odd kids in the control group. So you see that if we look at the trend over half a century, this is what it looks like. This is not a downward trend, but it's a flat trend. Um, it slopes down because in the early years, um, when you did a study and you gave an intervention to one group and you had a control group, the control group got nothing because there just wasn't anything around. You can't, you can't do a study anymore and have a control group. You can say to the control group, you know, you, you're not going to get this intervention. So the families just go and they join a program somewhere else because there are programs everywhere. So if anything, this is a significant conservative estimate. Um, also, 
you can see the bigger effects were from the smaller demonstration projects. Once you start serving lots of kids and systems, it's actually quite remarkable that there have still been positive, significant effects with large samples, with lots of other things going on. It shows you how robust the field is, but the conservative estimate message from this slide is we have half a century of showing we can make a difference, but it's been pretty flat. Okay, the, the size of the impacts 10 years ago, today, are about the same as they were 10 years ago, 10 years before that, 10 years before that, 10 years before that. Okay, so who's not constructively, lovingly dissatisfied <coughs> with that curve? I'm not. I assume most of you share that. Nothing to be ashamed of, but it says we've got work to do. And the first thing would be that we need some new ideas. This is not just about let's just do it better. And nothing to be ashamed of about that. What other field has found something and done it the same for decades and decades? So now I'm going to put my pediatric hat back on and I'm going to kind of shove right in your face a contrasting story. So um, in 1964, the summer before it, the first Head Start program was begun in the US, um, this five-year survival rate for acute lymphoblastic leukemia in children was about 3%. This is the most common form of cancer in children worldwide. Um, and um, 50 years ago, actually a little longer than that now, it was a uniformly fatal disease. Very few children lived five years with that disease. Ten years later, the five-year survival rate was 60%. Picture if we increased uh, our magnitude of impact in early childhood by that much in 10 years. Everybody would declare massive victory and we would say, you know, we know exactly what to do, all we need is the money. Well, that's not what happened in leukemia. Now, whoops, oh my God. Now the five year survival rate is about 96%. Um, and the question is, what can we learn from this story that's different? Well, here are a couple of things to think about, but let me, but here's the challenge, okay? Here's two 50-year stories. Um, and let me make a couple of disclaimers first. Um, cancer and poverty are not the same thing. Okay. Uh, it's easier to measure the effects of cancer when it's a high mortality rate than it is to measure the effects of treating poverty. So there are some very important differences. I don't want to overstate this. But so here are a couple of things to think about. Uh, for one thing, at any given point in time, including today, most of the people who work uh, in the field of acute leukemia in children are providing state-of-the-art care. They're identifying kids as soon as they can after the disease becomes apparent, and all the resources are going into providing state-of-the-art care. Um, but there is a portion of this field that has been devoting always resources to those people in the back room who are trying to figure out a more effective <coughs> treatment. Um, and everybody had a vested interest in that. The people caring for children wanted better treatments. The families of those children wanted better treatments. Um, to go from 2% survival to 60% survival was not good enough. Any of you want 60% survival for your kid? How about 97% survival? What if you're in the 3%? So there was the relentless pursuit of wanting to get better and better and better and better. And the new treatments did not come from somebody taking out a Ouija board or throwing a bunch of things putting stickers on the wall and seeing what stick. People dug deeper and deeper into understanding the underlying science behind the disease. What, how do we understand where its causes come from? How do we understand how it develops over time? And then use that insight to develop new treatments. Sometimes new treatments were tried and, they, and children died faster. And nobody said, let's not tell the funders. Of course, that was a hard thing to hide. Okay? But people said, we didn't do that because we thought it would have children die faster. We thought it was going to work. Why did we think it was going to work? Why did it not work? What are we going to change to do the next time? And then sometimes big breakthroughs came from putting together two treatments that each had a reasonable impact separately and together had a bigger impact than the two of them separately. That's, that's a fact. I'm not making this up. And here's, so there was an understanding that a deeper knowledge about the condition matched to new ideas about treatments would be what would move this field forward. But here's the one kicker that I really want to leave you with. So we now know that acute lymphoblastic leukemia is not one disease. There are at least a half a dozen variants of this disease. And you can tell now at the time of diagnosis, based on testing you can do, which of the six effective treatments is going to work best 
for the type of leukemia you have. Which is going to get you in remission faster? Which is going to keep you in remission longest? So we've got six subgroups of leukemia to help us figure out the best treatment. And we're still asking, what's the best program for kids in poverty? That, does that, what, that makes no sense at all, right? There's no such thing as a program for kids in poverty. There's no such thing as a program for kids who are, quote, disadvantaged. It's like how we need to have a deeper understanding of what is the nature of the condition, what is the nature of the causes of the problems. And that's why this science that's moving so fast now is so powerful. It's being used to develop new sub-treatments for disease. The same thing can be used to basically come up with new ideas about how to treat other threats to children's health and well-being. So that's kind of a little bit of the message. So if we take this and say, and now even for the kids who are basically cured from leukemia, the researchers are not saying, you know, mission accomplished. They're saying, how do we make the treatment less toxic? How do we improve the quality of life? How do we kind of get, it's like, it's just like this relentless pursuit of better and better outcomes. And we are still at, we have a statistically significant difference on one of 50 different things we measured, mission accomplished. So that's, that's the challenge. And I, I, I take this for our field as, that's, that's a challenge we should take on because we're better than just saying, we know all the answers, we just need the money, right? That's, but we're not gonna do it without the R&D dimension. Gotta have that. This is not a self-promoting thing. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a research scientist. I'm a pediatrician who's just trying to kind of use this stuff. Um, so the time has come to really start to find out what works in early childhood, for whom, how, and in what context, and what isn't working. That's, that's a whole mindset change about what we mean by evaluation and research. We rarely know precisely what an evidence-based intervention actually does and why or how it changes developmental trajectories. We do something, we measure it, we get a result that looks good, and we share that. And that's, that's an important start, I'm not minimizing that. But we don't know how many of these things work or we don't know why it worked for some children and not others. In fact, we usually don't even ask that question. We know even less about whom these programs produce a large effect for and who it produces no impact on. Because we look at on average. Think about where leukemia treatment would be if we were basically asking what on average is an effective treatment for leukemia instead of which one works for which kids. Okay? We don't know this. The, the, the important part of this is we have programs where we have evaluated them and we've shown some moderate impact. That is masking a huge impact on some kids. It's being averaged by kids who aren't getting an effect, and we don't know that. Um, so it's really time to shift the focus of this field. We have, we appropriately, in the 20th century, the challenge was proof of concept. We needed to show that, in fact, it's, you can change outcomes. We have, we've already answered that and proved it over and over again. Now we have to figure out how to take things to scale which is kind of what the policymakers are asking for and what the families are asking for too. It doesn't do a community any good if a demonstration project worked for 100 kids and we don't know how to do it for 100,000 or even 1,000 or 500. So it's a different challenge. And so what I want to do now is share with you, and actually we're going to do really good on time. I'm going to do fine on time. I want to share with you what it is we've learned about what it means to create an R&D platform and what it means to bring innovation into a world that has not been part of the way any of us were trained. I didn't learn in medical school or in residency what innovation is. Um, none of you whose background is in early education, uh, any of the different subspecialties around different kinds of therapies, uh, delivery of human services, child welfare, and none of those fields is, is professional preparation about innovation. Because one of the key things about innovation is you learn from failure. And I was like, I teach a course at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, the School of Public Health, and I'll well, never forget a couple of years ago, talking about this, and one of the students raised his hand and said, um, you know, I've been in education for 20 years, and it's the first time I've ever heard anybody say it's okay to fail. And if you, if you go into any field where innovation is kind of standard, people, you know, they wear it as a badge of honor. They talk about all the things that busted before they finally got their breakthrough. Now, of course, it's the big, the ones who have the big successes who get up on the stage 
and proudly tell you about all their failures because they've made it. You know, people who've never made it don't get up and talk about their failures. But, <laughs> but nobody has made it big time without a, without a lot of failures. So innovation is about risk taking, and in, <clears throat> and it's about co-creation. <clears throat> That's the other thing. People who've written about innovation and lived in that world say that no matter how talented and creative people are. You can't make breakthroughs in a field by getting together all the smart, creative people in that field. You, get it to, you do it by bringing together smart and creative people from that field and other fields who think differently and who get together around the same shared problem. So um, talked about this in the first session. Um, there are at least four, I'll make for simplification, four bodies of knowledge and expertise, science, practice, policy and the wisdom of a community, um, and they all have to be at the table. This is a co-creation process. Um, it's really, it's shared, and I'll talk in a couple of minutes about how you do that. Um, there are also c two kinds of interesting creative entrepreneurial types that are needed in our field in early childhood for this to happen. One we'll call the intervention developers. These are people who have ideas about things that, about strategies or approaches that will increase outcomes, will improve them. These are people who develop interventions. Um, they're different from the solution integrators, the people who have programs that are looking for new ideas to address problems that they're struggling with, right? You need to bring them both together. One has to identify needs. This is, you can call this a supply and a demand thing. We, you know, we've, we've never had a shortage of, um, people who have new ideas in the field, but we don't have an infrastructure and a system to get them out. We've also paid less attention. Usually it's been about who has a good idea and how do we, how do we increase the number of people who use it. But the equally important issue is the demand pull from the policy world, from the, serve, from the systems, the service systems world. Um, if they're not looking for things, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna incorporate that. It's kind of like somebody says, I've got a great new thing for you to do in your program for you to consider it, or certainly from a systems perspective. It has to address a challenge or a need that you know you need ideas for, right? So this is, those are different roles that want to build up to this idea that this is not only not just, you know, have some, put some brilliant person in a room and wait till he or she comes out with a great idea, but it's not, let's come up with new ideas. There has to be a system that's going to kind of respond to them and is going to want them. And then you need a mindset, you need teams and places that are ready. This is something that we have learned as we've been doing it. Even with all of these other pieces, you need a certain mindset, a mindset that is open to really try things differently. And where the leadership is there to make it happen. This is a little bit about the comment I made in the panel. Um, there is no, I mean, you know, everybody here knows that. There's no substitute for strong leadership, but also the leaders have to be leaders of organizations and systems where the people who actually do the work buy in and want to do it. So there's a mindset issue here. The target population, I'm talking about families and communities for whom we don't collectively with them have all the answers. Um, the community, the families have to be engaged in this. This is not finding families who are willing to be part of a study. This is not about saying to people who are struggling, um, we, have, we have a new answer for you. There has to be a co-ownership and engagement. Um, the need has to be defined. Um, this is something that I've really come to appreciate in the last couple of years. When we ask, and this is a, often when we have trouble communicating with policymakers, people say, what do you want? If I, were the, if I were the czar and I didn't want to do anything for early childhood, what I would do is I would say to the early childhood community, if you guys all agreed on what you want, I'll give you anything that you ask for. I know I'd never have to spend a penny, right? Or I say, you need to be more specific about what you want. And I would not be able to respond to people saying, we want to optimally improve developmental outcomes and support families and respect their autonomy. I don't even know what that means anymore in terms of what do you want me to do. So there's a need for specificity that we haven't had in this field. Uh, we have to define what it is that's missing or what is it that we're not achieving as much as we want to. And there needs to be funding for it. And you know this, and that's just the reality. And for people, whether it's a private sector or public sector investment approach, um, I hate to break this news to all of us, but you can't do this stuff for nothing. 
Uh, and in order to be able to have the time and the energy and give people a space to do it, there have to be the resources to do it. Um, this is where I won't even pretend I know a lot about this world, but I'm trying to learn about it. The venture capital world, um, none of these big breakthrough things happen by people um, working without resources. They have a little bit of a different advantage over us. People invest in these things on the idea that if it hits big, they're going to become billionaires. Right? So they give them a lot of money and they say, don't worry about the fundraising. Figure this thing out. We're going to give you the money. And the earlier you come in and invest, the bigger financial return you get. And people put huge amounts of money and make big bets on 10 things and they expect nine of them to fail. Because if one of them hits, they're going to really hit the jackpot, right? And you can't do this without resources. So it's just, it's just unfair to the early child. Also, for people who work in programs, you can't figure out new things in addition to doing your full-time job. You've got to have your time protected to do this. You have to sometimes to think and to try things that just doesn't work otherwise. Um, and then once all these things line up, we have this kind of process of people developing ideas and testing them and learning them and trying them and tweaking them and identifying them. And it's a circle. It's an iterative process. So that's kind of it. risk taking and co-creation is one critical dimension. The, ne the next is this critical need for greater precision in how we think and how we measure what we do. And I'll give you three areas of this. And if you're interested in these, we have a lot of stuff on our website, which we're kind of just beginning to put out there because we're just beginning to sharpen our thinking about this. But here are three areas where if we don't get more precise, we're not going to make any progress at all in terms of increasing the magnitude of it. We'll keep making a difference. I mean, if we do nothing new in this field, we'll keep making a difference, but not enough of a difference. Okay. So the first is a theory of change. Okay. Um, I won't go into a lot of details about this. We can talk about it over lunch if people want to. But we have to be much more specific about why we're doing what we're doing and why we think it's going to have an impact. It's, it's, the field is too mature now. For when people say, well, what's your program? They say, we do home visiting, we provide support for parents, and we provide rich experiences for kids in center-based programs. And that, that's, that's very sound. I mean, that, that sits on good knowledge. But, but then the question has to be, so what's, what, is, what do you do in the home visits? What do you do in the program? And why do you, what is it that you think that's going to have an impact on? And the, the answer can't be, it'll, it'll make children's lives better and families will function better. It's not specific enough. And the reason for that is not some academic purity thing. But every time we evaluate a program and we measure everything we can think of, and we come up with some changes on some measures, and then we go and do it somewhere else, and we get different changes on different measures. And, and that we're back to the question of, well, what are, we, what are we trying to accomplish? And how do we know it's working? So that we have to get more precise about that. We also can't replicate and scale if we're not precise. If you have a home visiting program, it makes a big difference, huge difference on some key measures. And you want to now do it with 10,000 kids. You can't say to people, make home visits and give and support families. It just, it's not specific enough. So we need specificity on what the theory is behind what we're doing. And then we need specificity about exactly what is it that we're doing. It needs to be manualized. We need, how do we train people? How do we train the next generation to do it? It's not, you, you, absolutely, everybody who works in the field knows that so much of the heart. Of what, by the way, if you don't know, it's an open-ended question. If you don't know the answer to the question, guess relationships. It'll be, you're likely to get the right answer. So relationships affects children's development. Yeah, relationships affects influences the effectiveness of a program working with a family, right? So there's a lot of skill and a lot of, of nuance there. But how do you train the next generation of people, say, make good relationships? I mean, we have to be more specific. And those things have to be tied to our evaluation plan. This field, so I'm, I'm now saying things. Are there any people from the press here? Is this being recorded? I, I'm going to say some things I just feel comfortable enough with you guys to say that it was different from what I'd say in a public forum. We have to stop doing evaluations by measuring every single thing we can think of, throwing it all in a computer, hoping that something good will come out, and declaring victory. It just, it's no good anymore. We have to be very targeted and very precise about what are we doing, why, do, why are we doing that, what do we think it's going to do, and measure that. And don't say, well, this was a program to enhance literacy. We didn't see any impact in anything related to children's literacy. but. 
statistically significant parents read an average of four minutes more a week to their kids. They spanked their kids 2.3 times less in a month. And there were some other things that we found that were of value. So this was a successful program. No, that's not good anymore because if we want to improve literacy, we've got to show how to improve literacy. If we want to improve parenting skills, then we've got to show we're improving parenting skills. We need that specificity. So precision, precision, precision. And this is not just for scientists. We de scientists are helpless without the precision provided by the practitioners. And the precision provided by the families to say, what do they want? They this wonderful story that somebody who runs a very uh, well-regarded early childhood program in Boston who described a mother uh, who just immigrated to the, uh, another country, came to the, moved into the city, went to bring our two young children to this program, asked the program director, about what services are going to be provided. And she explained it to the mother, and the mother said, not good enough. It's not good enough. It's not enough. My kids need more. That's powerful. It's powerful. And the answer shouldn't be an uh, unreasonable, demanding mother. The answer should be, well, so if, if, if what she's saying is right, so what are we going to do to respond to that? And maybe that will help our program be more, be more effective. So then the last kind of general message from the innovation world, none of which I learned in medical school or residency, or even in the early childhood programs I worked with early in my career, is this notion of rapid cycle iteration and learning from failure. So all of the incentives and all of the requirements in academia make it impossible to do this. In order to get a grant to do a study um, that's rigorously designed, you have to say to the potential funder, this is the study, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to measure, this is how we're going to analyze the data, this is what we think we're going to get, and if you get the funding, you have to do that. And if it's a three-year study, you can't change one thing in those three years. And that's not the way innovation happens. This is the way innovation happens. You start with a problem, okay, and you have a theory of change, what it is you think you think working with mothers to build their skills to kind of read to their child is going to improve the child's language development and vocabulary. That's a theory of change. You think that intervention. And you have, um, you, you test that. You go ahead and test that in the field. And you look at what other hypotheses there might be. But the point is, you start, you want to get to breakthrough outcomes, but you don't go in one step. So you start like this, you have a strategy, you target it to a particular challenge, you adapt it to the context, different communities, different families, and you measure how it's going. And in a short cycle of feedback, you say, this is looking promising. Or never will you say victory. You say, this is looking promising. I might want to tweak this. So you might change it a little bit in the next round. You adapt what you're doing. You do it differently for some families than for others, families who are dealing with different kinds of stresses. Um, you get improved outcomes for some, and you have challenges that make you think it again. So you keep, you keep changing, you keep iterating, you're learning as you go, and you don't hide the things that didn't turn out the way you wanted them to. You see that as a very important learning opportunity. Isn't this weird? So, okay, great, okay, thanks. And ultimately, in the stepwise process, you eventually get to breakthrough outcomes, usually for different groups, for different reasons, not one thing that's going to work for everybody. So this is about short cycle learning, changing as you go, iterating, and learning from failure. So those are some of the key features of an innovation mindset, the way you work innovation. I want to now end talking a little bit about how the way in which we have evaluated programs um, is part of the problem. And that we have to change the way we ask and answer the question of, is this working or not? Okay, so this is, this is a reflecting, reflective, this is not what the field is saying. This is what my colleagues and I are thinking about right now, and we're actually trying to do some of this work in a different way um, and to find out whether we're right or not, or not so much whether we're right, but to figure out how to move in a different direction because it's clear that what we're doing is wrong. So here's the problem, in my humble opinion. Okay. So we start with the fact that individual differences is what development is all about. And that if we're going to have more effective policies and programs, we have to move away from the question of what's the best one. These data are taken from, I know you guys, uh, there's a lot that goes on in Australia from Clyde Hertzman's work on the ETI. I know he's been a very important force in this country. 
Um, these data are taken from a, a population level study in Canada that looked at the relationship between uh, SES and in this case, receptive vocabulary scores. You know, this is the universal thing you always find. You find this relationship, a linear relationship between SES and in this case, vocabulary. It's, it's very elegantly done, it's real. But the real story is not the line, the story is the scatter. The story is that there are kids living in high SES families who have poor vocabulary and kids living in low SES families with high vocabulary. And if you want to understand things at a population level, the line matters. If you want to understand things at an individual level, the line is very misleading. Variation is the name of the game. Now, in, in paying real homage to my colleagues in the policy world, I have to say as a sidetrack. So we, we started about 15 years ago, actually right after we did Norris to Neighborhoods, we formed a group, National Scientific Council on Developing Child, and we, we set out on this course of wanting to um, translate complicated science for policymakers. And we made a partnership with a national conference of state legislatures in the US, which is a, kind of the professional organization for state level uh, legislators, along with the National Governance Association for the executive branch. And we did a partnership with them and we taught them about the science and they taught us about how to be effective in their world. It was a really, it's a very cool and illuminating experience. And we targeted the most conservative states in the United States because we figured, you know, let's, let's kind of really learn how to do this. So I will tell you, I hope this doesn't come out in the wrong way, but I, what I learned from that was, I should have known that much earlier in my career, regardless of where people are on the political spectrum, very few people hate children and want to see bad things happen to them. <laughs> people might differ on how to do it. They might have different opinions about government programs versus community programs or whether taxes should be increased, but everybody wants good things for kids. And the other thing is, the science always tells us that it's all about variation. But, uh, you know, in all due respect, you can't be a policymaker. So what's the power, 2 million, 2.2 million in Western Australia? You can't make policy for two million variations on the theme. You know, there's a limit to how much policy can individualize. So there has to be some sense of something other than every person has to be treated as individual. But a policy for the, in this area that says, you know, this, we're gonna look for the best thing for everybody is doomed to failure because variation is such a huge issue. So how do we get around that? So here's our thinking. And we're, we're just starting to work on this and we had some promising uh, things that we found so far to lead us to think that we're on the right track. So if we want greater impact at scale, not another demonstration project that will show some big effect for 100 kids, but if we want to take what we know to scale, we're going to have to rethink the way we define what we mean by an evidence-based program. I think evidence-based programs, I assume that's a big issue here, right? So who's going to argue against evidence, right? Not me. There is no international organization for the prevention of evidence-based programs, right? It's like, so it, it's like it, the concept is exactly right. The problem is the definition is dead wrong. I'm going to kind of go out on the limb saying that's opinion. That's not a scientific, that's my opinion based on science. And here's why. This is how we do it. This is a made up hypothetical um, evaluation of a program. The horizontal zero line is no effect. And all of the dots are the, you know, the, the participants in the program. So this is what you typically get. You do a, an intervention, you do an evaluation, and you get a lot of scatter. And, and then you statistically average all of those uh, different individuals. And here's the way it works. If the mean effect, if the average effect of all of the participants reaches a level of statistical significance, and in this case, it's above zero, so it's some effect that's statistically significant, you earn your badge of being an evidence-based program. Okay? That's the definition of an evidence-based program. We did a study and we found a significant difference on whatever measure you used. I, I won't even get into the issue of which measuring is it tied to a theory of change. But let's just take it at this. So here's the problem. I think you can see where I'm going. What is wrong with this picture? Instead of using this as our definition for an evidence-based program, which assumes that they were looking for the one effective program for this, this is what we should be asking. Why did it work so well for these children and families? Why did it work so poorly for these children and families? 
Those are the important questions. The average is meaningless. Ask me what the average effectiveness of treating cancer. I know we have some 100% cures, we have some 100% fatal. Tell me what the average is. Or as I know, Bob Reich is probably well known to many of you here, maybe. He's a colleague of mine. Um, he was a Secretary of Labor in the, the Clinton administration. He's an academic. Um, he's, um, he, he's, um, he's four foot, 10 inches tall. Um, he has a congenital um, bone condition. Uh, very healthy, but just he's, he's very short. It's obvious he's very short. Um, he did a television show on public television with Alan Simpson, who was a very conservative Republican senator from Wyoming, who's six foot eight. And the name of the program was The Long and the Short of It. And, and Bob would often say, look at the two of us. Our average height is six, point one, six feet one inches. It's meaningless. It's a, mean, it, it's a meaningless number. It sounds precise, but it's meaningless. So if we, if we ask these questions instead, what we would do is, we would figure out um, for whom this intervention is working really well. We would replicate it, not with everybody, but with a similar group for whom we got. And if we got the same, much larger impact for that group, we are now ready to start scaling that intervention for those children and families for whom we get a big impact. And we go back to the drawing board for the ones for whom it isn't working and figure out what to do differently. That's not what we do now. We take the average effect and we say, and we, and we say, we, we don't even usually get very far in the scaling, but when we do, we start grousing about the fact that we replicated it and we're not getting the same effects. Sure, because we're averaging a lot of stuff together that's missing the real story. And most important, we're, we're, we're dis, doing a disservice to both groups. We're not helping the group that's getting the big impact because we're not getting it to all of them. And we're doing nothing for the people for whom it's not making a difference. And the smart ones drop out because they say this isn't doing any good for me. And so the goal here at the end is not to answer the question of what's the best program. It's to build a suite of interventions that match different strategies to different resources, different needs, and different outcomes. And until we start doing that, this field is going to have a flat, it's going to have that same flat line, which is on average showing that on average we can make a difference. Um, that, by the way, was all personal opinion. Okay, so don't, don't, I'm not, not playing the academic card here, but it's driven by academic thinking. So uh, what we need is we need an innovation ecosystem. I'm borrowing this terminology from the world of uh, internet and information technology where everything is about ecosystems, right? But ecosystem works, it's the right term. So there's a pipeline that we need for innovation that's an adaptation of the pipeline that exists in every field in which breakthroughs happen. It starts at one end with sourcing. We need a constant flow of new ideas. There are never enough new ideas. Um, and some of them will work and some of them won't, but we need new ideas. Then what we need to do is we need to take the best of those ideas and we need to incubate them. We need to test them in relatively small pilot trials with small groups of children and families and see what's promising. And of those that look promising, and are at a demonstration project phase and shown to have a significant impact, they are not ready for scaling yet. There's a transition to scalability, which answers the question of, okay, this worked really well in this setting, and you replicate it, and it looks promising, but who does it work for, who does it not, what's the right dosage, how do you train people on how to do it, how do you replicate it with fidelity? You do all those things. It's similar when you develop a new drug. First you determine that it doesn't harm anybody, and yeah, find out, does it work? Does it look promising? And then when it shows, look at all these drug trials that, that go bust halfway through because a drug looks very promising, but then when you start to do a trial with thousands of people, you find out it doesn't work with a lot of people. Well, you didn't get the dosage right yet, or you didn't realize what some of the potential side effects were because you only tried it on 100 people when you started. That has to happen. We need the same pipeline in our field. And it's not going to exist by asking practitioners in their spare time when they're writing reports to kind of figure out the future. Okay. And also, this pipeline has to exist in an ecosystem. It can't be just by itself. The landscape has to have policies and public systems that are eager for new ideas and are making it an environment receptive to try new things. It needs thought leaders who are out there not asking, why have you not you haven't created a breakthrough in three years. I'm tired of this. I'm moving on to something else. Um, 
practice systems have to want to change. Practice systems have to be willing to be open to new things. And they shouldn't be unless they're good data, but they need to be open. And the private sector has a huge role here to play because the government will never have enough to do this kind of flexibility. It wants other, but it will be ready to scale when we've proven we have something to scale. So let me just end with a few thoughts about what we've learned just over the past five years of trying to figure out how to actually do this, to try, like walk the talk. This is, what I'll, this is what we've learned as a group and what I've personally learned. Number one is we have to be specific about what challenges or unmet needs we're trying to address. So it may be a particular group of families who we feel, you know, our program works really well, except there's a certain subgroup of families for whom we just don't seem to be working. We'd like to figure out what to do differently for them. Or it may be a specific dimension of development. People might say, you know, we do really well on early literacy, but we don't know what to do about problems in behavior. Okay? So it could be, or we feel we're making moderate impacts in this area, but we want to make much bigger impacts. It has to be a specific challenge or unmet need that brings people together to work on it, as opposed to let's just make the field better. That's never going to work. Second is we need a balance between the rigorous, rigorous criteria that the academics bring, the best of them, who will not, who don't want to be sloppy and say, you know, we've just got to follow the rules, and the most creative service providers and community leaders and entrepreneurs who say, I appreciate your rules, but live in the real world. We need much more flexibility. We've got to get a balance. This is not a win-lose here. It's figuring out how to balance those two in how we design interventions, how we test them, and how we evaluate them. A brilliant intervention that can't be implemented is worthless. You know, a kind of ill-conceived, not very well-defined intervention that everybody likes to do and the parents like is not going to help us. Because we need, we need to bring that balance to the situation. And all that happens, people who really respect each other and work together, and I know that's possible, but you've got to make it happen. Um, there is a huge amount of untapped energy across sectors. So this is, this is back to the silo issue, okay? This is, there are people in education and health and human services and protective services who have ideas. And when you start talking to them, it's like letting caged animals. I mean, there's just so much un tapped energy, and it's not just in one sector, um, but we have to create spaces for those creative people to be allowed to try, try things, take risks, and fail and not be penalized for that. And if we won't do it, we will never make breakthrough impacts, guaranteed. Um, and we also have to recognize the challenge. This was something that's been a hard pill for me to swallow, but I realize it and we're working with rolling up our sleeves and doubling down. The concept that we need to start focusing more on adults and adult skill building in early childhood, usually, you know, even if it gets a little opposition in the beginning, people, most people come around to it. But it is hard to do this in early childhood settings because most early childhood practitioners are not comfortable working with adults with problems. They're comfortable working with children. And there's a, there's a huge amount of, of confronting the reality of this. In the same way that a lot of people who work in programs focused on adult skill building don't know what to do when the kids are hanging around. Kids kind of spook them out. You know? just, I don't know what to do with the kids. Can't even talk to them. What are you going to do? So we just have to recognize the challenges as part of why this is good work. So this is any field. Um, and, and now we're talking about early childhood. To have a vibrant and increasingly effective early childhood field, we need a full spectrum of engagement. This is an adaptation from Everett Rogers, who's done a lot of classic work on how innovation diffuses in any field. So here's what early childhood looks like. We've got a part of the field on this end where we're struggling with basic quality issues. Inadequate staffing, people with limited training, not paid very much to deal with problems that even the most skilled people are challenged by. So there are basic quality issues that still the field has to deal with. Then there's the part of the field that's meeting standards, it's kind of good quality programs, and we're not serving enough of the population that needs on this access issue. And we need to kind of serve more kids and families who will benefit from what we've demonstrated we can do. Well. And then there is the, the, that part of the field that's state of the art that we look to and say, that's the goal. Let's get everybody to state of the art. We look at this state-of-the-art as the starting point, not the goal. It's kind of what goes next. And I'll tell you, as we've looked for programs to be part of our innovation network, 
this was something I learned early on, and I can just still hug those people for that experience. It was like we, were, we met with a group of 15 to 20 programs in Washington State that were considered to be, by the state policy, people, the best programs in the state. And the, they convened those 15 to 20. We were looking for a subgroup to start to create this incubator that we wanted to. And so we, we gave our pitch and kind of got a sense of who's interested in There were two different types of answers. There were some people who said, this, everybody was gung-ho. So there were some people who said, this is really cool. I'm so glad we found each other. We are state of the art, and we really feel like we're at the cutting edge. We would love to be part of this so that other people can learn and see what we're doing. And response to them was, you know, well, this is great meeting you. You guys are terrific, and we'll be in touch. Um, the people you couldn't help but hug were the people who said, we know we are considered to be among the best programs in the state. Every day we see the difference we make in the lives of children. But to be honest with you, there are a lot of children and families I don't feel like we're touching at all. We're desperate for new ideas. It was like, okay, let's, let's work together. Um, particularly the people in the child welfare, working in the child welfare system, they said, one said, I think, you know, the best program in the state, she said, honestly, one out of four families I feel we barely touch their needs. Could we please try some new things? Those are the people you want to work with. Um, people who are going to generate and test new ideas across sectors, not just in early education. And also, you want the early adopters, you know, the people who are going to say, I don't know, I can't do this, but as soon as you have something promising, I want to be the first one to try it. You know, it's like the people who are camping out two days in advance when the new, the latest iPhone is coming out, you know, and they, as opposed to people who say, I'll wait a year until you get the bugs out. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, I don't know whether Einstein said some of these things are tricky, but these, these work for me. If you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. That's the challenge. The flip side of this is, to raise new questions, new possibilities, regard old problems from a new angle, requires creative imagination and marks real advance in science. That's what we need. If we keep doing exactly what we've been doing, we will keep making a difference for a lot of kids and families. It will be statistically significant, but at a population level, we're not gonna make the gains on it. We need to provide some space and resources for people to come together and use their imagination and their science and their experience to try new things in order to break through. That's it.